improve outcome based on clinical genetic characteristics. And there are a couple of words I want to highlight. So one is uh, rules. So, so uh, when we are talking about rules, I mean, that can be you know, some personal med uh, some precision medicine or you know, some personal treatment for one individual or a subgroup of individual. So when we are talking about rules, actually we are talking about the subgroup of individual. And uh, actually pretty relevant to that is the uh, personal uh, warfare and treatment protocols. Uh, now the reason it's really relevant is uh, are we try to optimize for particular individual or subgroup individual. And actually this is very relevant, closely relevant to the application. For example, if you want to use a decision support system, you can read uh, lots of a patient's data into this kind of system. But the, the truth is not many hospitals, they, they can afford that. The, the thing is that if you want to use, for example, like warfare treatment for like a local small clinic or hospital, and want them to do personal treatment, that can be a problem. Because uh, if you want to use a decision support system, if you, your, your program is uh, designed to do that, they can afford to buy that kind of decision support system. So how do we take care of that problem? So in that case, we are looking for rules. And later I will show you more example about that. And also one other thing I want to highlight is uh, clinical and genetic characteristics. So, um, so clinical and genetic data, I mean, clinical data, we can really get lots of them in electronic medical records. However, for the genetic data, um, we, we know uh, there are more and more genetic data. But the truth is, uh, I want to ask you a question. Uh, when you go to hospital, have you ever received any genetic test before? <laughs> okay, so uh, actually uh, about uh, maybe like half, uh, half a year ago, we are looking at uh, insurance company data from in our healthcare. They have 150 million patients according to, uh, across 20 years. And we are trying to look for genetic information, genetic tests for studying treatment. And guess how many I get genetic tests? It's, uh, less than 50 <laughs> among 150 million. Right. Or, or it's more severe than, you know, right. Doctor, yeah. 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 Totally agree. Yeah. Uh, totally agree. So, so uh, actually, that is uh, uh, some some kind of like a you know a severity problem, and also uh, insurance uh, reimbursement policy because uh, uh, because uh, uh, actually uh, this is also a thing. Uh, uh, then, uh, because uh, right now we have more, we show more and more evidence regarding genetic, uh, how important that will be to the treatment, to the diagnosis. But I, I'm uh, talking about cur uh, the current situation. The current situation in, uh, in for most of the problem, the insurance company they don't reimburse that. I mean, uh, of of course there will be lots of space that we can negotiate with the insurance company and maybe supported by your physician <laughs> to do that kind of thing. But there is no 100% guarantee. And the things, so if when that happens, uh, usually that, that ha happens a lot, is uh, we need to pay for genetic tests, like one or two thousand dollars out of pocket. Okay, <laughs> and then, let me go to the next, okay. So uh, before I go to the next slide, I want to introduce myself. I'm an assistant professor in school nursing and core faculty in Institute for Health Informatics and graduate faculty in bioinformatics and computational biology in here in this school. Okay, so in this talk, I want to use uh, warfare and treatment as an example to talk about uh, wh what I said before, the rules, or should we optimize for individual or optimize for subgroups? Here's a quick fact about the warfarin. And warfarin is the most commonly used anticoagulant in, in the US and also in the world. In, in fact, we can just buy warfarin in Home Depot to kill rats. 
I mean, actually, the, the, the reason we have warfaring, the four word, WARF, that stands for Wisconsin uh, Alina, Alumna uh, Research Foundation. Because uh, uh, long ago, this is actually a rock killer. And, uh, and about like, uh, 50 years ago, somebody in Wisconsin, they found warfare is a really a very good blood thinner. So they use that to prevent stroke from happening. And uh, actually, this, uh, this kind of drugs is a really powerful uh, blood thinner. And it's highly influenced by many, many factors either a uh, phenotype or genotype. And for example, like, uh, like the, the, uh, the food you eat, uh, maybe last night or, <laughs> you know, anytime. And, and also, it influenced by lots of genetic factors, like CRP2C9, BKORC1. The reason I put that here is uh, later I will talk about them. And so in, so in this situation, um, the fact here is, uh, so for example, like, a certain dose of warfarin is good for me, but the, this kind of same dose can kill you, can kill the other people. So, so uh, currently, the best way to manage uh, how to control, how to get the dose is uh, we are trying to um, try to, uh, trying to uh, do a, uh, you know, the blood uh, withdrawal, and then. <coughs> Uh, try to test how thin your blood is. So that is what we call international normalized ratio, INR. And the, the bad thing is that we want to control the range between two and three. I mean, uh, uh, typically, there, uh, there will be some exception. But typically, it's uh, between, between what, two and three. So, so, so th this is what happened. So if, uh, if uh, this INR value is more than three, then you will have internal bleeding, just like kill the rat. And, but if uh, this level is uh, lower than two, I mean, because this drug was used to prevent stroke, so you still have a, a risk of stroke. So you can see uh, you face uh, the double uh, side uh, of adverse event. So the things, uh, the, in general, the longer time in this INR between two and three, the longer, the better. And here's a challenge. <coughs> also, the good thing. The good thing is that we have a lot of treatment protocol that can help us uh, to identify, to control uh, the, uh, uh, the warfarin doses based on INR value and help you to stay in the therapy range as, good, as long as possible. But the flip side is uh, currently there about like, uh, I, th I think about two years ago, we did a little review. Currently, there are like a 50, 60 different kind of protocol. And the thing is, uh, which one is the best? <laughs> so, so up to here must, must be very interesting about uh, what, a, uh, what a protocol looks like. Uh, uh, late, later, I will, I will uh, talk about you know, uh, the protocol. So here, to do this project, we are actually we're doing the four-step approach. So the first two step is a treatment simulation. And uh, step three and step four, uh, we have treatment optimization. So in the treatment simulation, is, uh, in the beginning, we want to create 1.5 million clinical avatars, as uh, uh, Peter Tonado <laughs> introduced before. That's in this project. And clinical avatar is a simulated patient. So the reason we want to create similar patient is uh, in this uh, original, we do have uh, EMR data from Aura Healthcare. And the thing is, uh, in, in that kind of data, uh, we actually, we, we do not have a genetic test. However, the thing is, uh, uh, in, lots of in lots of literature or lots of you know, genetic study, actually, they have done lots of study in like a genetic variation for the uh, warfarin treatment. And those kind of knowledge actually exists in lots of literature. So we try to combine the two together. So the way we combine it is, uh, you know, uh, on the left hand, we try to learn the pattern from the uh, our healthcare EMR data. And on the right hand, we put a distribution uh, provided from literature 
to combine them together. And then after we have uh, this contrain model, then we produce the, what we say clinical avatars here. They're similarly patient. And then in step two, uh, in the next slide, I will talk a little more about the step two. So we'll conduct a 30-day orphan treatment simulation on clinical avatars. Okay, and step three is uh, we want to identify or optimize uh, the treatment protocol for the individuals. And step four is uh, based on individual optimized data, we try to produce uh, rules so that, that that kind of rule can uh, can cut the, the personal treatment for that particular individual, uh, for that particular subgroup. And also we can make a rule of it. Okay, so let me start from step one and step two. Yeah, so, um, so, so here uh, on the left, you can see there's a clinical avatars. That is uh, what we're talking about. So the way we do the treatment simulation will be that in a big, uh, for a warfarin treatment, uh, the patient receives a warfarin every day. So, so that's why you can see the warfarin input. And we provide that input and, for the, and, and provide the input, uh, the warfarin treatment for the specific dose to the clinical avatars. And the next step is uh, we, we use a form called kinetic pharmacodynamic model to create this, uh, to produce, uh, to predict the outcome, which is the international normal ratio. And the, the reason we, we are talking, we are using from, from kinetic pharmacodynamic PKP model is, uh, uh, as we said before, we want to, uh, uh, we, we, we want to uh, you, uh, use uh, two handout information, clinical information, general information. And also, on the other hand, there's no data that we can learn, um, learn to produce this outcome prediction model. Because in the EMR data, typically we can see will be one individual, their first INR maybe, maybe three months later, and the next will could be like one year later. And the other individual, maybe uh, like a six month later, and uh, then, then the next one eight month later, like that. And instead, instead of using machine learning to learn that kind of competition model, we use a PKP model, which is widely used in ph pharma, uh, pharmaceutical company, and from in, and also in the field of pharmacy. Okay, so after we have this PKP model to predict the INR. Then we can, we can see, we feed this information back to a warfarin input. And here, uh, the protocol will start to take effect. For example, like uh, here with this uh, five protocol. So, so, so in this protocol, the protocol will, will, ha will tell you how to, uh, how to adjust the dose based on the predicted INR. Okay, so we provide new dose for the clinical avatar. So the next day, we adjust the dose and then predict another PKB model. So you can see, uh, we repeat this process again and again. So here, the uh, yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So um, I'm, I'm sorry, the same model, but uh, their value will be different. I mean, because uh, their genetic clinical factor can be very different. Um, no, actually, uh, that, that combines uh, lots of information. So uh, clinical, I mean, uh, for example, your genotype and also your clinical factor. Uh, later, um, there's uh, one slide I will talk, talk about what kind of factor I'm going to use. Okay, so uh, once we have a lots of NR, we produce uh, another, another value called time is therapeutic range. So this example, like uh, here we have a uh, uh, we have a 10 INR, and the time with therapy range is uh, what is the proportion of INR in, in this range. And, and also, uh, th this is what the protocol look like. So uh, in this example, you can see in day one, day two, the, the clinical avatar received the 10 milligram daily doses, uh, 10 mi milligram doses. And then starting from day three, uh, for example, the first column, 
is uh, less than 1.3. So in the next two days, we receive the, uh, the 15 milligram. We receive the 15 milligram. And then starting from day five, uh, we test uh, the INR again. And then that value decide the dosage for the next three days. And, and, and also for day uh, 10 to day, day, uh, 8 to 10, uh, uh, that will be a repeat the same process. So this is just uh, one example of protocol. So speaking of protocol, actually, uh, as we said before, here we have we show uh, five different protocol as an example. Uh, the first one called AAA. So the the A stands for HC, rural healthcare. So actually, this this is a protocol actually conducted in rural healthcare, and uh, in this uh, in this uh, experiment, we uh, uh, we make into make it into a computer coding to provide the dosage to for clinical avatars. So, so here you can see uh, some, uh, some protocols, they are clinical based, uh, which, and some protocols, they are form code genetic based. So in this, uh, in the form code genetic base, that means uh, the patient need to have a genetic test. So we, uh, we get to the next step is, uh, is uh, uh, first we identify the individual uh, protocol. Yeah, and, and, and then produce the decision support rules. Okay, so, so I, I try to combine the two step, uh, the two step into uh, one, one step. So, so here we use a PKP model to try to, uh, uh, we, uh, we use optimization to optimize to find out what kind of uh, I'm sorry we optimize the dose uh, uh, to try to, to find out what, uh, which stream protocol that can uh, minimize the two side effect a two side adverse event and based on actually lots of variables for example uh, we know race, we know age, we know smoker or not, or uh, weight, or those kind of things. As you can expect, if you want to read so much information, we really need a DSL support system to do that. And this is just an example. In fact, there will be more. And so on the other hand, for rule-based system, uh, for, for a rule-based personal treatment, in fact, in that case, we only need to find out what kind of um, what, uh, what kind of variable that is uh, most relevant, and in that case, we we try to use uh, try try to find out the personal treatment protocol that can maximize the outcome for this particular group of people. And here is uh, one thing. So when we are trying to do this kind of clustering, in fact, there will be lots of approach to do that. So uh, in, in the next uh, couple of slides, I'm talking about supervised machine learning clustering method. And uh, so as you can imagine, here we are using the program to try to find out what, what kind of feature that's most relevant. However, in a clinical setting, uh, the physician may, may not read like that because they, they just want to know some specific subgroup or specific cluster they're interested. So, the uh, so the up approach we are doing uh, we are doing right now is a uh, um, the domain expert clustering. Okay, so first I uh, I want to show uh, the treatment simulation result comparison between a real healthcare patient, I mean the real person, or uh, clinical avatars, the fake patient. Okay, so in the first column, you can see the characteristics. And the second column here, you can, you can see the aurora warfaring patients, they are the real patient. In the third column here, you can see aurora warfaring clinical avatar, the simulated patient. And as you can see, mo uh, most of the, the characteristic distribution, actually they are pretty similar. And actually, th this is just one way we show um, how close 
the similar patient to the real patient. In, in fact, we, uh, behind this, we actually did a validation of that. And if you are interested, I mean, uh, we, we have a paper in circuit like, <laughs> that really took a, a lot more validation on that. And the second result is uh, we are going to show the 12 rule to decide personal treatment protocol based on clinical genetic characteristics. So as we said before, we, we are contracting decision support rule and something that can just paste on the wall <laughs> to do personal treatment. So in, this, so in this kind of rule setting, you can see for the younger, pop younger population, they are aged are less than 65. And then the VKORC, if they are variant type, and they are more likely to, uh, if they uh, receive a PGA protocol, they are more likely to, you know, to minimize their two-sided risk. And so, so uh, also the reason we want to use the decision tree to do this is, uh, uh, so when we are doing the clustering method, as we said, mentioned before, we want to use a, um, we want to uh, min minimize uh, the entropy and also impurity. And the reason is uh, we want to maximize the over, uh, maximize overall outcome for the largest population. So next is, uh, so how the purpose look like. So here, uh, the N1 to N12, they correspond to to this number. So here we can see we have 12 subgroups. And uh, so for each color bar, that, that represent the one feed of protocol. So you can see AACAA to PG, PGI. And the last one is a personal protocol. So that is the protocol recomm recommended by this rule, P for example, PGAA. So this black bar is a PGAA. So, so each bar, we, each black bar, we have a different version, of, uh, a, a different personality protocol. And so, so here you can see that if we compare the personal protocol with a one feed of protocol, in general, uh, on, on average, we, we improve the outcome about 50% to 31%. And, uh, and also another thing we want to do is uh, we compare this average to, uh, we uh, compare this result to national average. So here the national average is, uh, is, uh, uh, is a meta-analysis study. I think it collect about like 100 clinical trials. So we compare uh, the black bar to this national average. So you can see for most subgroup, I mean, uh, this uh, personal protocol, uh, they, they per perform much better compared to the national average. Okay, and also the next thing is uh, the plan and ongoing work. So we said before, that uh, we really have a, uh, really there can be lots of different version of classing approach. So the currently the classing approach we, uh, actually, here we are only introduce the supervised machine learning subgroup optimization, and at the same time we are doing individual optimization and supervised machine learning, try to find out the most popular uh, subgroups and also the expert sub optimization. So later in the, so that's uh, the reason later in the acknowledgement pages you can, uh, you can see a, a medical doctor that are getting involved here in this project. Okay, and also one other thing I haven't mentioned before is uh, above a personal protocol reduce two-sided risk equally. So basically we treat both of them equally important. But for some particular population, really we want to, um, maybe breathing is more important. For the other, maybe thrombosis is more important. So in that case, we can set up the constraint or uh, given different weight to control this optimization algorithm. Okay, so this is my acknowledgement page. So the first one is uh, Dr. Peter Torado, who is our last speaker, and uh, Karosh and John from Oral Healthcare, 
because uh, we are working together. And also, we have a look from computer science and engineering at Tatiana for, uh, from BSCB program in our school, and also Dr. Terry Allen from IHI and uh, pharmacy. Okay, and thank you. So uh, actually, it's related with the previous my question. Yeah. So kind of here, okay. So age is older or uh, younger, or the CYP enzyme portions are different. Right. And how this affect the uh, parameters of the PKPD model? So is it known or based on reference, or how do you decide it? Um. So so for that PKPD model. Uh -huh. uh, uh, we, we are developing that uh, treatment process. You know, yeah, in the beginning, uh, we uh, conduct a review and try and uh, find, and uh, we, we did lots of effort to, uh, to, to filter and to find what kind of, what kind of existing uh, a PVD model that can be used for this, uh, uh, this uh, treatment simulation setting. So when they are conducting that kind of research, actually they uh, they are trying to find out the relationship between uh, their INR response and and also another question like serum level or currents in uh, uh, of these drugs. For, for example, if, uh, if uh, one just uh, quit this drug, I mean the effects still there, but maybe last for like a three four days. And I remember in work and it lasts for like five days. Mm -hmm. So so I uh, so. So, so actually that involved two process. So one process we conduct data review to mm -hmm. find the, cur the current PKE mm -hmm. model. Mm -hmm. And the second is a, uh, I think there is a term called superimpose. So that superimpose will be, you know, integrate the effect of the previous drugs, uh -huh. of the warfare maybe uh -huh. you know, yesterday or the next, uh, next two days, and combining that in, into the current PKE model. Uh -huh. And finally, uh, so so one of the validation approach we did, uh, we we did here. I, I didn't buy this. Is that we try to uh, compare the serial level and compare that to, to uh, the the current uh, literature we found. And for example, like we compare the concentration and metabolism in the body. No, kind of thing. Yeah, I guess you change the model when the patient. Huh? Do you change the model when the patients are different? Your avatars are have a different characteristic. Then yeah. do you also change the model? Yeah, we change that, and uh, and more importantly, we we want to we, uh, we need to validate mm -hmm. how close that will be. You know, even uh, even uh, this big model they are developed in different populations. So uh, if you are interested, you can find more information. Okay, here. And this oh, here. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and, and here we, uh, we did actually use uh, this uh, treatment simulation platform mm -hmm. to uh, use that to conduct a clinical, clinical trial simulation okay. and compare that result to the actual clinical trials. Yeah. Thank you. So, any more question?
Uh, I direct a program at Mayo Clinic, the Biological Discovery Program. Uh, and I want, also want to disclose that a lot of the things that I'm going to be talking about we, we're trying to commercialize, so I have uh, uh, some commercial interest. In, uh, in, uh, and, and we actually started a small company called, called Genome LLC in here in Minnesota using some of that stuff that we uh, licensed from Mayo. So, uh, I want to talk a little bit about specialized medicine too, but the, the good thing is that the speakers earlier, Peter and David, uh, already kind of uh, discussed the conundrum of personalized medicine quite a lot. Um, the only thing that I wanted to bring is that uh, until now, medicine was based on standard of care. So there was this, reg you know, regulations that were telling people how exactly they should treat this particular condition. And, and, and personalized medicine goes against, it's really contradictory to standard of care. So it's going to change, if personalized medicine ever to happen, it's going to change a lot of things. And, and even the education uh, of, of uh, uh, medical doctors. So we'll see how, how this is going to happen. Now I'm going to try with this talk to explain some of that. Uh, I want to start with this question. What is an individual cancer depend on? You know the cancer evolves, right? Does it depend on what it's starting from, or does it depend on what it is? The state that you're, the patient is in. And then, the treatment. How does the, the treatment depend on? Is it the origin or the state? So, um, you put a slide like this uh, in any uh, medical institution, especially anatomic pathology, and everybody's going to jump and say what this is. Does anybody know what this is? Mm. Some Here? kind of tissue? Or yeah, it's tissue, very good. What kind of tissue? <laughs> tumor? Yes. Cancer cell? Cancer tumor? Yeah, it's tumor. Yeah, of course it's tumor. Prostate, <laughs> maybe? Right, very good. Oh. Those three are all prostate cancers, and those two are? Liver? Blood cancer. Blood. Anyway, pretty good though. Wow. Prostate <laughs> cancer, you got it. Uh, it's a pattern three, four, and five. And when they see this pattern, they say, okay, this is bad, and the first one is good. All right, so there is a little bit of personalization, just looking at tissues. But it is, the, much of that is dependent on the origin. Because that, especially that one over there looks very much like, you know, how normal prostate looks like. The glands are there. And that's how they recognize. They're, they recognize things because they've seen them many times from the same tissue. So, uh, a lot of us in bioinformatics for some time, we've been trying to figure out, uh, you know, big data is good. So, uh, it's very, the, the data is complex. And, and I'm showing here a plot of uh, an added two RNA-seq experiments, actually, between a lung cancer and a prostate cancer that I showed you earlier. As a matter of fact, the green is actually two of the same uh, tissue, where the red is the correlation between two different tissues. And you can see that at the tissue level, there's a lot of differences, right? And many papers the last 15 years were showing these heat maps. Nature papers, uh, I'm sure you've seen many heat maps. These heat maps never made it to the clinic, by the way. Mm -hmm. but they, they made it to great papers, but they never went to the clinic. <laughs> and there's a reason for that. And uh, what I'm showing here is really an unsupervised way of looking for genes in lung cancers. Okay? And what you see is that the patterns of those particular genes, those genes were just bimodal genes. The patterns show the different subtypes of lung cancer. You know, these are the adenocarcinomas. These are the carcinoids, the small cell, squamous. I don't know, I think this is head and neck. So, which is also squamous. So you can see that just from expression, the, the, the expression profiles are pretty much telling you where the cancer is coming from or what is the subtype of the cancer. A lot of the microarray data was, was giving us much of the origin. You could use these genes to cluster, this is a Simon mapping, so it's projection of all of these genes on the two-dimensional space. And very quickly you can see by, by this clustering that there are three major clusters. There's a squamous, there's a neuroendocrine tumor, so the carcinoids and the small cell fall in the same place. And then these are the adenocarcinomas, and the green is actually normal lumocytes. So the normal lumocytes fall with the adenocarcinomas that says the adenocarcinomas likely come, like come, like come from the pneumocytes but not the squamous. The squamous come from a different subtype. Now, if you look at, even within the same cancer, sometimes you do see genes, like this one here, 
that is kind of bimodal. Some of those cancers have it high, and some other cancers have it low. Those are all normal here. So you can see that this particular gene overexpresses only in cancer and in only a subset of cancers. That ER gene is called ERG in this case. And uh, this is in the two dimensions. Again, you have the normals down here. These are the threes, fours, fives, the prostate cancer, and then some of those seem to be high. So this gene overexpresses in a very bimodal way. And we were looking for, things, for genes like that. Uh, all this started actually from a paper that was published 10, 11 years ago by a Rose Schneider group from Michigan showing that this particular ERG gene is coming with a, uh, by a rearrangement between Tempers 2 and PRG. So you have chromosome 21, you have a deletion, and those two come together. The promoter of this comes with PRG, and you make the fusion that that gene overexpresses. And that is happening in 60 or 70% of the prostate cancers. Very important for understanding the biology of prostate cancer, but unfortunately, it's not targeted. A couple of years after that, though, there was another group um, who came up with this other fusion, the ML4 ALK fusion in lung cancer. ALK is a kinase, and it is targetable. So uh, about 5% of the, of the patients with lung cancer have this fusion, and instead of going to particular chemotherapies, they go after, they go, they take uh, ALK inhibitors, like resulting in for something like that. So, and, and they do very well with it. So from this, we started realizing that in the DNA, there are ways to find things maybe that the RNA wouldn't really give you, because the RNA is more of the origin. What's happening really in the DNA? I got interested in that, and I tried to find ways to look at the DNA of cancer cells. And at the moment, you can do whole genome, but it is expensive. So we developed a technique called MPC, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. For about $700, we can look at the whole genome of, uh, of cancer cells for the arrangements and for fusions. So, so this is a whole genome experiment. These are all the chromosomes. And if you cut the sequencing in, in uh, the mapping data in windows, and count how many sequences you hit in every window, so if you do typical count statistics, you will see that most of the windows will be on the gray. But some of them are below, some of them above, so you can do the distributions and figure out what are the deletions and what are the gains or amplifications. All right, so this is a whole genome sequencing experiment. If you focus in one window, you see this is how the sequence is mapped. I should be using this actually. So, uh, so rather than using this view, which is the uh, the linear view is what we call it. We use this view. This is called the genome plot, Q plot. We invented that at Mayo, and the chromosomes are, are, are more like in a, in a U plot. The large chromosomes on this side and the small chromosomes on this side. This is the other way of looking at whole genome data, the circus plot. I don't like that as much because, you know, the orientation changes about this. So you'll see quickly why this is a little bit better. So here's the whole genome of a normal uh, cell, uh, uh, cell type. Here are all your chromosomes, uh, smaller chromosomes on this side. As you can see, every little dot, every window, this 30 kb window, is gray because it is within the right distribution. But sometimes you have sequences that they jump from here to here. This is what this line is. I'll show you the sequences. So here's this window here and this window here. And all those sequences jump from one place to another. And that shows a balanced classification. Now, this is another patient. Look, all those places right here are below what the gray points are. And those are deletions. And if you look more carefully, like here's a deletion. Those are the lines that they jump between the two points. And that's how you. But if you look carefully on this one, there is kind of a strange way of how things connect. So it's very complex on how things happen. Here's another one. If you look at that, a little bit carefully, it's very complex. You know, it's much of deletions, but if you look at the whole genome data, you realize that there is a, what we call a chromotripsis in this chromosome. Can anybody tell me what cancer this is? That's prostate cancer. You know how I know? Right here, you have this deletion of chromosome 21. That's the temperature 2 ERG deletion. That happens only in prostate cancer. 
70% of the prostate cancer have this. So when you see this, you probably could say this is the prostate cancer. So you, so you have this, this complexity going on. Like for example, this is a case, uh, it's a simpler case. It has deletions on uh, chromosome 11, 14, 16, and 20, and the lines kind of show how they connect. And if you wanted to see this is how those lines are, and if you simulate it, this is how they connect. The complex way of connection. So all right, how do we do that? How do we get this type of data? Well, we develop MPC, it's called genome sequencing. It finds uh, rearrangements of location to digital duplication, but it does not, and also genes, but it cannot detect mutations. This is not for mutations, this is just for large things in the genome. And we develop all the different uh, modules, both experimental and theoretical and analytical modules to come from DNA all the way to uh, reports. This test now is launched at Mayo Clinic, and uh, you can order it already. So it's already made it to the translator. How does it work? Well, well you know, how, how do you do that on, with only $700 is the question as far as the data? Mayo Clinic charges a little bit more, but. Um, the point is that you have, if you could cut the genome in larger pieces, you can actually cover points much better with larger pieces than with small pieces. Problem is that the sequences, the sequencers only sequence small pieces, like four or five hundred nucleotides. So how can we sequence large pieces? And this way cover the genome better. Well, we use this main pair protocol, so you cut the DNA in large pieces, you put adapters in the end and biotins, Circularize, so now the ends of the, the large segments come close to each other, and you break it again, and then you collect it with the top of the top of it. So you collect this way only the ends of the of the, of the big fragments, and then you can see it. And a chip like this can be a saving of uh, uh, five times less. For five times less money, you can do the same thing as with whole gene. And then we develop all the algorithms to. To analyze this kind of data, we developed BIMA. Uh, BIMA is a binary indexing algorithm, mapping algorithm. It actually takes nucleotide sequence, letters, converts them, converts them to binary numbers, zeros and ones, and then uses interesting uh, uh, computational uh, tricks to, to map things. So if you compare it with BWA or Nova Line, it's much faster and much more accurate for main per sequencing than the other techniques, and that's published in this paper here. In, uh, in bioinformatics. And then after we take the data and we map them, we use uh, modules to uh, extract information from this data. Like for example, we look for clusters in the data so that we can find these translocations. And I am mapping all the data here on for chromosome 9. Um, you see there is really a lot of points everywhere, but if you look closer, you find things like this. That's a cluster right here, and that cluster is a true deletion, let's say, problem nine. All right, so let's go back to the whole genome. I'm going to go back to my point that I started with, uh, origin versus, uh, versus progression. So can anybody tell me what cancer is this? Prostate cancer again. Very good, prostate cancer. <laughs> <laughs> is that a deletion of chromosome 21? Look at this, yeah, perfect. And it has this amplification here on AI. This is actually a, 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 a person that was deprived of androgens. So it amplified AR so that it can overcome the androgen uh, the progression. And all this, this is the lines that connect all that stuff. So this is prostate cancer, but it looks completely different than the other prostate cancer I showed you, right? OK, what about this? What is this? Prostate cancer, right? ERG, the amplification on AR. But very different than this. Look. How about this? <coughs> but that does not have the ERG deletion. Does not have an AR amplification. But this is prostate cancer. Similar pattern of the structure. No, not at all. It's completely different. As a matter of fact, it has an ALK translocation. It has an ALK uh, So it could be that this patient should not be given AR uh, deprivation, but, it, but maybe an ALK inhibitor. So we start seeing that some patients might be different. They might be looking like, an, like a lung cancer patient. And I'm going to see, uh, so, so 
this is a paper that, that was uh, published last year. This is a characterization of an alveolar arrangement uh, in, a, in an IMT, which is a sarcoma. A uh, patient came uh, at Mayo uh, with a very large uh, uh, line mass and masses everywhere in a wheelchair. And uh, uh, the Dr. Maxwell gave him uh, chrysotomy or sanitinib, I think, which is an alk inhibitor, because those sarcomas are known to have alk inhibitors. And then this, this went from here to that. So there is only a little piece that remained which we took out with size and we did whole genome made per sequencing to find out what exactly was happening. Well, this is what was happening in the whole genome. Anybody know what this is? It's called chromoplexis. It's actually uh, multiple chromosomes come into a knot and then the system tries to fix that knot. And it makes this chromo, through chromosynthesis, a very strange chromosome. But right here is where ALK is, and that's chromoplexis resulted to an ALK fusion. But it was not clear to see it. You actually had to go through the maze to find the fusion from one place to a chromosome to another point to another point. And then doing that, you could see the fusion, which you can see it a little bit better here if you do a little bit of patching. And then we used uh, primers on the cDNA and found it in the tumor and found it okay. Okay. So this is, can anybody tell me a little bit what that is? I doubt because I didn't teach you that. But this, this is actually a pancreatic cancer. It has a huge amplification on chromosome 17. Everybody knows what is in chromosome 17? Very important gene. ERBB2 or HER2. So this looks like it has an amplification on ERBB2. If you look more, more carefully, this is the amplification, and this is the expression, and ERBB2 is the most expressed gene in that amplification area. So, so this particular tumor could be uh, HER2 positive for that cancer and maybe the benefit from uh, HER2 inhibitors, accepting prestuzumab, uh, prestuzumab, uh, and things like this. So looking at all that together, at Mayo, we uh, decided to have this protocol. We call it Tiger Bio, or Tiger Treatment uh, Protocol. And what we do is we, the patient comes in, we use uh, the tissue two different ways, frozen to do this part and then cryopreserved to do this part. In frozen, we take the frozen and we go catch of uh, genomics to figure out what is going on in the tumor. And then we do integrated analysis and we think what could be the best way to treat a patient so we have a hypothesis. But we also have this 3D system I'll talk to you about where we can validate that hypothesis and if that works, we can try it on the patient, uh, monitor the patient with self DNA and maybe even come up with a biomarker. And we understand that we need all kinds of techniques to be able to do this right, as it was already mentioned earlier. So we need MD-seq, exon, RNA-seq, and maybe others. Let me talk to you a little bit about 3D system. You, you, know, you can observe anything, but nobody's going to act on it at this point. Nobody's going to act on a very new thing that was not indicated before. If we had a way to prove that this, uh, that the particular drug will work for a patient, that we think that it would work. Uh, oncologists might, if they have no other option, they might take that option, okay? So, in the past people were trying to do things like that with cell lines. That's an impossible uh, experiment. It takes, takes years, and by the time, you know, you, if you know anything, the only thing you can do is maybe a publication. Then they move to avatar systems, that is taking uh, tissues from patients, putting it into a mouse, and let it grow into a mouse. But that takes about eight or nine months. For most cancers that that matters, it is too long to wait that long to make a mouse experiment. And it is too expensive, actually. So we are moving into what is called the 3D systems. The, the hang and drop system is the following. You can take a tissue, dissociate it, and split it into a 96 well format. You have which looks like a pipette. So each one of the wells has a pipette. The tissue goes like that, starts growing, and then when it grows, when the tumor grows, it drops. And you do your experiment there. But you have 96 wells, or maybe even more, to, do, to be able to do many experiments. You can almost do drug screening. Okay? And this, you can do in 10 days. So much faster and much cheaper, because it's uh, in the microenvironment. So, uh, so we wanted to establish uh, a rapid and reliable 3D micro cancer model, is what we call it. Um, there is 
significant uh, 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 advantages over the avatars, which is the mouse systems. Uh, difficult to establish. Uh, there's no good models for the immune system response, and I'm guessing you're going to hear about that in the next talk. Um, and uh, the three T models capitulate proper structure and maintain tissue heterogeneity if you do it right. Uh, even normal tissue can be modeled. So there's a lot of advantages. And um, definitely there's a lot of advantages on over 2D cultures with uh, the cell lines. Um, with, with a lot of people have shown the gene expression, the drug sensitivity, a lot of things are, uh, are different between 2D cultures and, and 3D cultures. Um, so this is how uh, day four micro cancer looks like in that well. This is starting from 500 cells, 2,500 cells, and 10,000 cells. The person who does that is another Greek, actually. His name is Panos Anastasiades. He's down in Florida. And he's a guy who uh, understands cell-cell interaction. So, so he was the first person to figure out what are the right media to do this. And I'm going to show you an example of a patient, the triple negative breast cancer patient that, uh, that had liver metastasis. He was doing pretty badly. The, 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 the markers were going uh, higher. It was not looking good. But we were able to take tissue uh, for those two arms. We did genomics. And then we also do the 3D systems. Here's what the genomics said. There's a whole genome view. And uh, if, there was, if that patient was a HER2 positive breast cancer, she would have an amplification right here. I think I have one like that. Yeah. So here's a, another breast, breast cancer patient. Here's the amplification right there. Okay. And with that, when we, when we see that amplification, we treat breast cancer patients with, we call them HER2 positive, and we treat them with uh, uh, Herceptin. And that, was, that, that works very well for 90% of the patients. But unfortunately, this patient did not have an amplification on, on, on chromosome 17. But she did have a mutation on HER2, which was not seen as pathogenic, but it was supported once more from another place. She also had a lot of other mutations. So each one of those bubbles here that you see here are mutations. So she had a hypermutated phenotype. Now you're thinking if she is hypermutated, should you go for immunotherapy? Would that work? Or should we consider that this HER2 mutation might be important? Well, one thing you can do is look at the RNA seq data and see how it compares with other things. And this is the ERBB2. This is this all these are HER2 positive patients that we have in our database. And the patient is, you know, kind of in the middle of that bunch. So High expression and mutation. And this is the PDL1, CD24 is the PDL1. It's the lowest of all the patients. So if that was your mother, where, which way would you go? Right, you go HER2. But they're not going to act on it because that mutation is not known. But if you have a 3 system that shows that pattern in the same, which is a HER2 inhibitor, does very well <laughs> compared to other drugs. Then uh, the oncologist might be more willing to do it. So we did this. This is a fattening. So a fattening works very well. And uh, as I was saying earlier, her, her markers were going up. That's when we started fattening. The markers are going down and they're even lower right now. And the cancer disappeared everywhere from your body except the brain. This fattening doesn't go into the brain. But what they did is they put a stitch and they put receptive in the brain and it started going down in the brain too. So. It could work. That's what I'm trying to say. There we have examples where we can do genomics, we can do these 3D cultures, validate our hypothesis and, make, and, and see if it works. So many reasons can be observed to solid tumors, and we have a pretty inexpensive way to find them right now. And uh, as I showed you, I've looked at uh, 2,000 genome plots myself. I can beat any uh, pathologist when I, when, when I see a genome plot or what it is, because I I've seen all these patterns and I know what it means. So when I go there, I can, you know, be cocky and tell them, you know, I know what it is. <laughs> um, there are driver genes like RT and RIV2 that are often uh, activated by arrangements in different solid tumors, and we might be able to repurpose drugs with doing this way. We need integrated analysis because, as you, I showed you in this example, both the mutational and 
uh, whole genome analysis was important, and they are basic. And uh, I think the 3D microcancer models are extremely important, and they'll make it to the clinic soon. If they are not, I'm going to open a company on this too. So uh, many people to, to thank uh, around here. I put a, a, a number of people, but one thing you know, might realize is that there are this, there's people from microbiology, pathology, uh, functional, uh, <coughs> algorithmic, oncology. Our idea is to pull multidisciplinary teams together to work on this. So we really want to change the standard of care and how people uh, work with each other to make this uh, think tank. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. It's really re exciting work. Do you, uh, it, it's also pretty labor intensive, and if you do probably all that analysis gets a little bit expensive. So do you start with uh, the, what you call your, your technique, but do you start with the, the, the rearrangement studies and, and then go from there if you if it's not informative, or do you have like a stepwise diagnostic right. approach? And, and, and you put it right very well. It, it is all about uh, level zero. Level zero is whole genome rearrangements because there's a lot of action in rearrangements in, sorry, in all tumors. A small number of people don't have, them. most of them have rearrangements. When you have the rearrangements, especially the reissues, and then you put the mutations, you can see the double hits. Like this patient, for example, had a double hit of T53 for CSD1. On the more important things, because one part was deleted, the other one was mutated. Okay. And the RNAs, the RNA seq the expression is being on top of that. So if you see our genome plots, if you go zoom in, you can zoom in, you can look at the genes, and the genes kind of go up and down according to expression. So we integrate the data on the genome plot, is what we do right now, and that's an easier way for us to see what's going on. We call that the genomoscope. So let's go from a microscope to a genomoscope. And that's the, the way we do it. Maybe somebody will prove us, prove it other way, but it's better, but that's, that's how we do that. Yeah. So your mutation studies are mostly based on exome seq? Yeah. Um, is that uh, mainly because of the cost consideration, or you believe uh, Yes. If you did whole genome to, to, to find mutations in solid tumors, you'd be spending $15,000. If you, because of heterogeneity, most of the most of the tissues we collect, they have 50, 80 percent normal cells. So you really have to uh, to be to do you know high high coverage to be able to see the mutations. The exome has that coverage that you need because you are actually covering only. You know, two percent of the percent with exome. So that's the problem. The problem is coverage. When we get to the point where we can cover the hundred x and we can laser capture or dissect, uh, well, maybe we'll be able to do with the mutation on that sort of But we're, not, we're, not, we're just doing exome for. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the organizers invite me to present my work here. And I guess uh, this title is probably the longest one. I, hopefully, my presentation won't be the longest one. I will make sure that uh, the meeting will be end on time so that you guys can enjoy your remaining weekends. Uh, so basically, um, uh, I'm the uh, director and associate professor at the Jerry Omic Center at Harvard Medical School, as well as the Broad Institute. And basically, for today's work, I'm going to spend.
Okay. I'm going to spend uh, two thirds of my time to introduce you the background of the cancer immune therapy, as well as the problem that biological problem that we are facing, and then going to spend maybe one third of the time to talking about the uh, the solution that we are currently working on, try to using the deep learning uh, algorithm to predict the new antigens, and also welcome your suggestions or or any comments. Uh, I'm glad that I actually followed the presentation by George, which is a previous speaker, so that you guys know that the cancer actually is a disease of the genome. And we know that uh, it's actually quite challenging in treating cancers. Even nowadays, uh, the average five years survival rate of uh, all cancer is about 68%. And it's ra actually ranging from 5% to 98%, depending on the cancer type and the uh, stages. And we know that. Uh, every cancer is a different, every cancer type is a different. So basically we consider every cancer type itself is a disease. And even in within the same cancer type, uh, every cancer patient is also different. That is so-called the intertumor uh, heterogeneity, as you can uh, as you can see from here. And basically even from the same individuals, if you took the uh, biopsy from uh, cancer patients and you're looking at the tumor lesions, you will find that there are multiple sacron in the cancer lesions. And then these sacrons might reflect the uh, physical barriers from the blood flow as well as the cancer microenvironment. <coughs> and if you zoom in a little bit deeper, so you can find that uh, actually each cell uh, not only between the subchrome, but even within the subchrome, they might have a different genetic component as well as the epigenetic component. So usually when you're looking at the gene expressions across these multiple subchrome, you will find that their gene expression are actually quite different. And as George presented that, uh, you can see that uh, he actually gave a lot of example for prostate cancers. And you can see their arrangement and copy number gain and those are actually quite different, even for the same cancer type, uh, between different tissues. And so right now we know that the challenge actually is uh, very sort of uh, big, but how can we actually efficiently treat cancers? Um, so uh, I guess you might aware that the uh, Jimmy Carter, which is the former president, and then he actually has a melanoma, and then uh, that melanoma actually spread out to the brain and the liver. And last year, he actually announced he has completely cure uh, from his cancers. And basically, he received the treatment, uh, including the surgery and the, uh, the uh, X radiation treatment, as well as the uh, pembrol, which is one of the immunotherapy that is considered as the immune checkpoint inhibitor. Uh, to inhibit the PD-1, which is the programmed cell death. And that inhibitor actually to block the protective uh, mechanism of the cancer and allow uh, T cell to kill the cancer cell. And this news actually attract a lot of median uh, attentions and made the immune therapy becomes a new hope for the cancer treatment. However, the immune therapy actually is not a new idea. It's about 100 years ago, and people already, uh, already applied uh, so-called immune therapy into three cancers. I think the first record report actually is the, uh, probably uh, 19, uh, 1890s. And there is a treatment which is combined the toxic from two bacterial strain, uh, serotonin and the streptococcus and to treat the solid cancers. And the treatment actually consistent to work until 1916, until FDA considered this is an experimental treatment, and it become illegal to actually treat in the patients. Uh, for the past 100 years, there are a lot of skeptical of the immune therapy and not very success. Until 2011, uh, the immune checkpoint mechanism has been identified, and that the immune therapy become uh, uh, people start to rethink about the immune therapy as a core therapy to treat cancers. And to uh, talk about the immune therapy, we have to first looking into 
the cancer immune interactions. The cancer immune system interactions can be conceptualized into several events between cancer cells and the, our immune systems. And it starts from the antigens that derive from somatic mutations. The antigen usually are uh, sort of uh, released from the uh, tumor cell when tumor cell are dead. And they are uh, usually, some of this antigen, they usually will, uh, will sort of uh, appear on this uh, surface of the APC, which is the cancer antigen preventive cell, and most of them are dangerous cell. And this, uh, this sort of antigen will bound to this uh, so-called MHC ideal, major uh, histone comparable complex ideal. And then this ABC cell will uh, move to a lymphonoid, and it will activate the naive T cell, and then uh, make the, so the T cell receptor recombinations. And then this mature and sort of the uh, diverse the T cell will move to the blood flow and then infiltrate into the tumors. And then uh, it will recognize the cancer cell by the bonding between the T cell receptor and the peptide uh, MHC compress. And then re after recognize the cell, this uh, cytotoxin T cell will kill, kill the uh, cancer cell. And so this is sort of the cancer immune cycle in healthy persons. So normally, the immune system should be able to, as I just mentioned, should be able to recognize the tumor cell and then distinguish the tumor cell from the normal uh, counterparts and kill the tumor cell. However, in most of the cancer patients, the tumor cell actually escaped, uh, escaped from the immune system surveillance. And this is by the so-called immune checkpoint uh, machinery, which is the inhibition pathway to inactivate the T cell. Uh, as shown here, under the uh, normal physical conditions, the immune checkpoint protein, such as the PD-1 I just mentioned, that used to treat Jimmy Carter and the CTLA, uh, this protein, they will, uh, this is a receptor, and then the normal cell has the PD-1 ligands uh, as well as the B7 ligands, and they will bound to the PD-1 receptor and CTL4 uh, receptors. So that way, they will inhibit the uh, T cell activations. And this is so, under the normal conditions, this is so, to, so sort of to maintain the cell tolerance, which is to prevent the autoimmune that uh, actually our immune cell target the normal cell and destroy the normal organs. However, the tumor cell also have a such mechanism to escape from the immune surveillance. So basically, they do have a PD. L1 ligand as well as B7 as well as others that bound to the T cell and then the T cell uh, cannot recognize the tumor cell and treat the tumor cell as a normal cell. So that way the T cell won't be able to kill the tumor cell. As you can image that if we identify such uh, immune checkpoint and try to sort of block the immune checkpoint and that way we will that the T cell recognize the tumor cell as a tumor cell, not a normal cell. And then uh, the T cell will kill the tumor cell. And this is, and this is uh, one of the immune uh, sort of uh, therapies called the, uh, the, co called the, um, the broad immune checkpoint uh, blockage. And uh, this type of the uh, immune checkpoint uh, protein, uh, there are roughly about 20 or 30 of them, and the most uh, famous and also have been approved by, by FDA, including the PDL1, PD1, and CTLA. Uh, in addition to the immune checkpoint uh, modulators, there are also other uh, cancer immune therapies, such as immune system modulators, therapeutic uh, antibodies, as well as uh, immune cell therapeutics, such as CAR T cell cancer vaccine and the personalized tumor-specific neoantigen uh, targeted vaccines. And uh, in the following sort of presentation, I'm going to focus on this uh, tumor-specific neoantigens uh, targeting vaccine as one of the uh, cancer immune therapy weights. And so basically, I just mentioned that the uh, tumor-specific neoantigen derived from the tumor somatic mutations. And basically, such new antigens are specific expression in the tumor, but not in the normal cell, which is considered more foreign to the immune systems. And 
can trigger more stronger immunogenicity than the tumor uh, associated self antigens. In addition to that, this type of uh, tumor uh, specific new antigen therapies is less likely to induce a tolerance and nearly impossible to induce normal tissue toxicity uh, because this is only, uh, these new antigens only uh, express on the surface of the tumor cell, not the normal cell. In addition to that, this type of the tumor specific new antigen derived therapy is more adaptable because it sort of, uh, the immune system is sort of can be applied to multiple different cancer types. And it's more durable because the immune system has a long-term memory to remember these uh, antigens that show on the surface of the tumor. And it is more synergistic because this type of uh, therapy can combine with other cancer therapies such as uh, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, or surgical therapy. In addition, it also can combine with other cancer immune therapies such as the uh, immune checkpoint brackets. Right, so the, uh, just a little bit background from the, uh, for these uh, so-called tumor cell specific new antigens. So what, what make uh, somatic mutations uh, become a new antigens? And uh, I just mentioned that uh, basically this uh, new antigen is a consequence of the tumor cell expressions. And these uh, mutations must also be expressed as uh, abnormal proteins. And this sort of abnormal proteins, they are usually partially degraded by the uh, normal cellular recycling machinery through the proteinase process. And it will be cut into a short A212 amino acid mutated peptide. And this short mutated peptide will be transported out to the surface of the tumor cell through the uh, ER uh, terms. And some of this mutated amino acid peptide will bound to uh, the surface, bound to the MHC class 1 allele on the surface of the tumor cells. And when they bound to this uh, surface and become the peptide, mutated peptide and MHC complex, and uh, your T cell uh, through the T cell receptor will to go to the tumor cell to recognize the peptide MHC complex. And when uh, the T cell recognize it, and it will treat it as a, a foreign G cell and try to kill the tumor cell. Uh, so that's basically uh, how the new antigen being formed from the somatic mutations. And so, because I mentioned that the new antigen was from the somatic mutations, so you might image that when a cancer type has much more uh, muta somatic mutation burdens, it uh, must have much more sort of new antigen re uh, repertoires. And shown here is an uh, estimation of the new antigen uh, repertoire from the TCGA data set, uh, Cancer uh, Genome Atlas data set. And on the y-axis is the somatic mutations uh, burdens uh, per uh, million base pair. And on the x-axis is different cancer type. Uh, on your sort of right-hand side is the most uh, mutant uh, cancer type. And toward the, uh, your left-hand side is the less mutant uh, cancer type. Uh, as you can see that uh, melanoma, lung cancer, uh, as well as some of the stomach cancer, coronal cancer, they have a, a higher mutation burden. So by estimations, they probably have much higher uh, new antigens repertoire. And compared to the cancer types such as the uh, multiple myelomas or leukemia, they have a relatively low mutation burdens. And so by average, they will have less uh, new antigen repertoire. However, this does not mean that uh, using the new antigen therapy won't be able to have efficacy in such cancer type. In addition, uh, from this study, people also find that a large fraction of these new antigens in human tumor actually is not shared between patients at a meaningful frequency. So that means for each patient, we need to estimate the new antigens uh, by itself. And so this type of therapy certainly is uh, very personalized. Uh, especially, uh, especially customer for each patient. And so I just talked about the theory and I want to give you an example for a successful clinical trial on using the new antigen as a, as a treatment. Um, so this uh, 
case study, this is one case, a clinical trial study that published in New England Journal of Medicine last year. Um, so basically, this is a 50 years old women with uh, metastasis colon rectal cancers. And in the colon rectal cancers, we know that the k rays G12D mutation has been found in a lot of the, colon, uh, the gastrointestinal cancers. So basically, the treatment is to target k rays G12D as uh, new antigens. And so what they do is they actually using the patient's uh, lymphocytes and then uh, engineering, uh, engineering, so the uh, genetic engineering, the T cell receptor to recognize the K-rays G12D uh, antigens. And then they actually put this uh, engineering uh, CD8 cell into the uh, patients, back into the patients. And then after the treatment, after uh, six weeks of the treatment, they found that uh, so here only show four lesions. Actually, there are seven lesions. And uh, after six weeks of the treatment, uh, you can see that the cancer lesion actually become uh, smaller for all of the seven lesions. And after nine months of follow-up, you can see that majority of the cancer lesion become disappear, uh, except for one lesion. Actually, it's progress. It's become bigger. And this lesion actually uh, has been so the surgically removed uh, at the uh, month nine. And they actually follow additional four months after uh, this nine months. And they find that there are no cancer regions has been progressed. So this one case can go try uh, provide the evidence to show that the new antigens type of the immune therapy uh, seems to be efficacies. Um, so I just mentioned that the, uh, the uh, new antigen repertoires uh, depend on the burden of the somatic mutations. And as you can see from this part that there are in average like roughly 10 mutations per million best pair for melanoma, uh, and then roughly about the same for lung cancer and colorectal cancer. So you can image that uh, these people, they probably have tons like thousands of the somatic mutation in their bodies. And how do we know which one actually can be all, how, or which of those somatic mutations actually can be considered as a new antigens? And so here, uh, in the previous slide, I mentioned that uh, uh, in terms of the interaction between the tumor cell and the, the immune system, so in order for the T cell uh, to recognize the tumor cell, to kill the tumor cell, there are two uh, very key important steps. One is the new antigens must bind into this person's uh, specific HLA type. And then this uh, mutated peptide and HLA complex must be recognized by the cancer patient itself's T cell uh, receptors. And so that way, it will trigger the immunogenicity and trigger the immune response. So when we predict the new antigens, we also need to uh, predict these two sort of process. And the so-called the accurate prediction of new antigens means that the new antigen should be immunogenicity effortless and trigger the immune response. And so basically, the, uh, the new antigens must be highly bounding to the MHC subtype that the person has, and as well as the person's CD4 and CD8 T cell uh, uh, regarding to their T cell receptor must be recognized this specific uh, mutated peptide and MHC complex. And you, you probably will say that um, why we have to do this very precisely uh, predictions? Why can we just validate them? And then after we do a in vitro validation and then we put this uh, new, and we identify the true uh, new antigens and then put it back as a vaccine to the patient. And the challenge is, uh, as you can see here, the usual time cost to predict new antigen and to generate the vaccine usually take about uh, three months. Uh, including to get the biopsy from a uh, cancer patient to perform a uh, whole exome somatic mutation as well as a genome mutation around the sequence. 
and then to predict the new antigens to generate the uh, peptide as a vaccine and then to get it back to the patients. And if we do this in the so-called uh, the CAR T cell, which is the genetic engineering T cell to engineering the T cell receptor to recognize the new antigens, that probably will take four months. And so that, that means that we don't really have time to do the uh, uh, in vitro functional validations because that took too long. In addition to that, we also don't have enough sort of a material because in order to do in vitro uh, functional assay, we need to get the patient's uh, lymphocyte and then try to see if the uh, tumor infiltrate lymphocyte from the same patients and they can recognize the uh, somatic mutations derive new antigens that, that we predict from the same patients and generate into the vaccine. So based on these two sort of reasons, uh, we think that we need to have a very accurate predictions of the new antigens. Right, so for the following 10 minutes, I'm going to talk about the ongoing projects that we we did uh, try to predict the uh, new antigens. So there are um, uh, already some public available tool to predict new antigens, such as the MHC, uh, net MHC, and MHC pen or MHC Bori. And those methods are based on very simple sort of uh, predictions, such as the artificial neural network to predict the bonding between the uh, somatic mutation derived uh, small peptide and the HLA, as well as the, uh, the mutation peptide uh, MHC complex with the T cell receptors. And we think that uh, using sort of a deep learning uh, might be help us to improve the uh, predictions. And because the, uh, this type of a deep learning, they're actually using multiple hidden layers. And theoretically, this should be our performance uh, simple model, such as uh, artificial neural network only use one sort of uh, hidden uh, layers. And the reason why we think, in addition to that, uh, other reason why we think we can apply deep learning, including that there are new algorithms that can make a deep learning uh, more efficient. In addition to that, also the uh, advanced in hardware such as GPU that will make the uh, sort of deep learning uh, process more uh, computational uh, saving in terms of the time. And also uh, there are large and complex data set that probably will benefit from this multiple layer, uh, hidden layer deep learning uh, process. And there are multiple different uh, deep learning types such as the uh, deep belief learning, convolutional neural network and recurrence neural network. And we have applied all of these methods in the uh, new energy predictions. And in the following slide, I'm going to uh, give you some result of the convolutional neural network predictions. And we find that convolutional neural network actually outperform, outperform other neural network uh, learning. So here is our model for the convolutional neural network, which is quite uh, simple. Uh, so basically, we design a two convolutional sort of layer, and then one uh, fractal sort of layer, and one fully connected layers. And our input data is the HLA type and the uh, polypeptide bonding data from the experiment and from the AA index. And the apatose uh, bonding affinity is also estimated from the experiment from IEDB database. And so the prediction is based on the IC15 output from the IEDB database. And the IC15 is the bonding affinity between the uh, HLA and the peptide. So we do a uh, different uh, analysis. The first result I'm going to show you is uh, we train each, each of the HLA subtype individually because we know that each individual has a different HLA subtype and each HLA subtype has different sort of experimental data. So we train HLA subtype individually. And shown here is a multiple different HLA subtype, uh, called as Alio here. And then uh, under the training column is the number of the training data set that we can get from the experimental data set, as well as the test data set from there. And the uh, output from the training 
is indicated by the Pearson correlation, which is the correlation between the IC50 uh, from our prediction model as well as the experimental observation of the IC50. And we also estimate the accuracy, which is we have an IC50 as a cutoff and then consider high IC50 as a yes, bounding or no boundings, and use that to estimate the accuracy. And as you can see that when we train, when we train HLA RDO individually, and we can see that a lot of HLA RDO cannot be trained because of uh, they are lacking of the data. And also you can see that the accuracy actually range from 65% to 97%. Uh, it's, it's not very robust. And then next, we, add, we train all of the HLA RDO together. We pull all of the HLA type RDO together. And then you can see that the total data point, uh, data set is roughly about 27,000 uh, data points. And for each test, the data set will be exactly the same because um, that, that is specific for each RDO type. And then, uh, again, we estimate the Pearson correlation as well as the accuracy. And then you can see that we pretty much can predict new energy for majority of the HLA type. And the accuracy actually is much better than training the HLA audio uh, individually. Uh, as you can see here in this uh, bar chart, the blue bar is the uh, HLA type training individually. And the orange or the red, reddish color is to pull different HLA type together and tra train them together. And you can see that uh, we actually improve the prediction accuracy for pretty much for all of the HLA type. And even for some of the HLA that they have a very few data set, we can also get a, a good sort of accuracy here. And not even for the rare HLA type that we don't have much data. Even for the HLA type that are common and we have a lot of data there, but we found uh, pull them together, we also can get a sort of much improved uh, accuracy and as well accuracy as well as the Pearson correlations. And so in terms of how to validate this finding, we participate uh, in a Tesla project. Um, so this is the Tumor Epitel Selection Alliance project that hosts by the Parker Institute. Um, you guys probably familiar with the Tesla, but probably not familiar with the, this project. So basically, uh, the project is actually not, not funded by, by Elon Musk, just to you know, make sure that. Um, so basically, the idea of the project is try to create a platform to compare and validate the new epitel prediction pipeline, uh, especially focus on to validate uh, those prediction epitel by use both of the bounding and the functional assets. Uh, so there are about 22 academic uh, partners and 12 pharmaceutical partners that participate uh, in this Tesla project. And basically, the Tesla project has three different phases that for different uh, specific patients. For example, the phase one is for the melanoma. As we understand that melanoma actually has highest uh, somatic mutation burden. So we expecting that melanoma probably has much higher new antigens uh, repertoire. And so it's a good sort of cancer type that allows us to do this analysis. And then uh, second phase is for lung cancer and then for colorectal cancers. And so basically for each phase, uh, the Parker Institute will provide a soma uh, DNA sequence for a tumor and uh, normal, adjacent normal cell or normal cell from the same patients, as well as RNA sequence and clinical HLA typing. And each participant institute, they use their own algorithm to predict the new antigens. Like us, we're using our newly development uh, CRM model to predict the new antigens. And then we submit our predicted new antigens, which is probably hundreds of them, to the Parker Institutes. And they will perform the uh, in vitro validations. And this in vitro validation, including two parts, uh, including the peptide bonding, uh, such as the HLA bonding, as well as the tetramer bondings. And uh, another part is the epitope recognized by T cell infantry lymphocyte, or PPMC. And this is basically try to looking at the uh, connection between the T cell receptors and the, the new antigens MHC complex. 
And this will be done by looking at the cy uh, cytokinesis release uh, after the bonding between the uh, lymphocyte and the complex of the uh, mutated peptide and NHC. So the project is ongoing. We have submitted our predictive new antigen to the Parker Institute, and they should be able to provide the uh, validation result uh, sometime in the next months. So that will allow us to validate our uh, prediction accuracy and also allow us to retrain our uh, model to make it uh, better, uh, has a better accuracies. Uh, so due to the time, I'm going to uh, briefly summarize our work. And so basically, we found that the benefit to train all HLA A type together uh, can be seen in two aspects. Uh, one is for rare HLA ideal with uh, very little or no training data. Uh, the try to put all of the HLA ideal together, such a model will provide a way to do the prediction for those rare ideal. And even for the common ideal, the prediction accuracy actually improve, and it's probably due to the amino acid sequences that are similarly uh, with other HLA RDO, and those information will help to improve the HLA RDO. In addition, we found that our uh, sort of CNN model outperformed other simple versions, uh, neural networks such as ANN, DBN, as well as RNN. And there are a lot of ongoing work uh, we, we are currently working on, including we are actually adding more information into the model, uh, including 48 different structural and biochemical information for the uh, peptide bondings between the MHC and the mutation pe peptide, as well as the, uh, the TCR receptor and the uh, complex of the mutation peptide and MHC. Hopefully, putting more sort of structural and biochemical information there that will help us to improve our predictions. In addition to that, we know there are multiple HLA type, not only for HLA, there are also HLA B and C. So we are working on to also putting all of the other remain HLA uh, ideal into the model and train them together. In, in addition to that, we know that those uh, mutation peptide they are not only in nine amino acids, sometimes they are ranged from nine to 15. So we are going to release our model to including all of the nine to 15 amino acids there. And as I just mentioned, once we got validation data, we will retrain our model with validation data. And in addition to that, we are going to combine uh, this result, which is just so uh, is a prediction between the HLA bonding and uh, the mutation peptide, together with the T cell receptor and the uh, peptide MHC bonding. Uh, these two model together, so hopefully that will give us a better prediction to predict the new antigens. And thank you for your attention, and your suggestions are very welcome. Any uh, questions or any Suggestions. Just a very quick question. So your, your training and testing data, those are obtained from experimental? Yes. Or? Yeah, those are from the experimental data. That, are that those publicly available somehow? Just <laughs> yes, that, those are from the IEDD database and oh. AI index. So those are probably available to us.